Web Systems, Lesson 3, The Web and Security, Part 3, Authentication and Access Control. Another service that we use often is called Authentication. And this is one that a lot of people do think is what security is about as well. It's used for many things. For example, who are you? What's your authority level? Are you part of UTS? Are you allowed to use this application? That's a big one that I see a lot. An example of an application you might be using could be UTS Online. Are you allowed to access our website? Simple as that. And the thing is, how do we work out who is this person? It could be a password. It could be something else. So let's take a look at some examples. Probably the most obvious one is a password or a PIN number. We have our, we have, go to a website, you type in your user ID and password. That's something that you know and hopefully you've never shared with anybody else. When I go to an ATM, I type in my PIN code. Again, only I know who that PIN code, well, maybe my wife does too, but hopefully not. It could be something that you've got. For example, I don't know if you've seen this thing, it's called an RSID, it's called a secure ID from RSA. These numbers actually change every minute and it's synchronized with your server. So you may log on with a password, it'll ask for your secure ID pin, you type in the number, in this case 1234836, and that lets you log in. Um, it could be a token. Here's an example of a token, it's a USB key. It could be a, a pin card. For example, your credit card. That's a physical object that you have. You stick it in the machine, and you have a pin code as well. Two-factor authentication, very useful. Another one I didn't really mention, and I should since it's becoming very popular, is SMS. If you log on to Gmail, you can set two-factor authentication. When you log in, for the first time on that browser, it'll send an SMS of a magic code to you, to your telephone. On your phone, you simply type it, you, on your phone you'll get a, a number like G1234. You type it into the website and it lets you in. Much more secure. You can't get that in Nigeria because your phone is here in Sydney. Another mechanism to use is for example something that you are good example a lot of these um, for example the iPhone 6 onwards has a fingerprint reader if you have an uh, IBM ThinkPad they often have a fingerprint printer as well um, I actually worked at a place which had a palm reader and fingerprint you put your whole palm on it it actually read your prints and you still had to type in a pin number to get into the machine room um, you might have seen retinal scans on science fiction movies like um, Mission Impossible or things like that. Again, it's a possibility. Face recognition has become very, very popular. Lenovo machines have had this for years. And now you can do it through passport control. It looks at your face and recognizes it. I haven't seen voice recognition becoming very popular because, quite frankly, you can record it. I suppose you could do the same with a face, but it's probably easier to fake a recording. So authentication works. I'm in. It knows that I am Chris Wong. Chris is cool. But the question is, can Chris access many things? For example, can I, am I enrolled in web systems? Not really. I'm an instructor. Could I, for example, have access to programming fundamentals? Not unless I'm authorized to do it. What about social engineering? Other classic tricks. You get a, fo a phone call. You say, look, I'm the, I'm the system administration of a system. Can you tell me what the root password is? Probably won't get it, but they might work it out. So you need to know who you are. When you get certain uh, certain um, identification documents, like a passport, for example, you often need things like letters of introductions. They need to see your photo. You need things signed in many places. They need to be issued somewhere and somehow. Somebody has to do it. So a good example is we need to check, are you real or not? So the question is, who's it issued by? Now, in the web, real World Wide Web, there's many top-level organizations that will validate a company. For example, there's a company called RSA, for example. There's companies called VeriSign, for example. Or there's even government companies like OzCert. They can validate and vouch for your internet presence. And they'll put a date on it. They say this is valid for the next five years. 
might be because you simply have a loan, you're paying a license for five years. That could be money, who knows what it is. So keep that in mind. Authentication is important, but to verify who you actually are and are you the right person is another story altogether. So the question becomes, where do we authenticate? Now the perimeter, for example, could be the website www. Or it could be, for example, the door. Physical things, it could be the operating system, the login prompt, the application itself, or all three. Who knows? It's up to you to work it out. For example, let's have a quick poll. What are the processes for students? Well, obviously, we've got a PIN number. If you're accessing buildings uh, 10 and uh, a few other buildings which don't have the key cards yet, we might have a card, your student card, you have a password. There's many processes out there. So what happens with staff who are students as well? They happen to have exactly the same process, but what we do is they get a staff number as well as a student number. So we have two separate user accounts with different levels of authority. But it can be painful because what happens if you're a student who's a research student and a coursework student? You need to be aware of multiple student lists. That's a really hard thing to do, but we'll leave that for another subject like network servers where I talk about that. Another example, let's go back to our web example. Um, let's log on to the web. We typically will have a pop-up. Here's an example. I logged on to the uh, UTS staff website with my own account. It'll ask me to log in. This is what we call basic authentication. The idea is we simply have a user and we enter a password. Fundamental problem is the password is transmitted in the clear. Despite the fact it says asterisk, 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 the computer at the other end and the network itself can see that password. It's scrambled slightly like our ROT13 algorithm. I think it's more like a ROT64 algorithm but it's still easy, it's super trivial to, to break. Like what I said trivial, it is beyond trivial. You talk about two seconds of computing time in modern computers, it's done. Not a very good encryption algorithm, but it was simple in the old days of the 1980s. Um, there's other types of authentication out there. There's a thing called web forms. Now this is good because notice it's green. See that? HTTPS. Good news. So when we type in our student number we happen to have that 1234 and password 1 are transmitted in an encrypted web page so nobody can see it. The third type of general web security is what we call client-side certificates. Like I said earlier a third party has validated who you are and they've given you an electronic key card. Usually it's just a file with a password on it but it's actually an encrypted password embedded inside some special type of file called a client-side certificate. And this is an example one used by the tax office. If you pay, pay for example, uh, you need to access uh, restricted sites like paying your tax as a business, they have a thing called OzKey, which is very useful. OzKey, it's actually a Java application that runs in your browser. Java, not a good idea, but still exists. And what it does is it actually sends an encrypted key to the government and it says this is you and it's actually a legal signature as far as the government's concerned. So let's take a look back at Unix. Now Unix has authentication as well and typically it's by user ID and password. Again, not the world's best practice but that's the way it is at the moment. In most cases it's fairly trivial. They store in a file called etc password. If you log on to the Linux workstations, use the old famous cat command, cat, etc. password, even on Linux Jim, and you'll see it's a simple plain type file that has a user ID and a whole bunch of information. There's a special file that stores the password in encrypted format called etc. shadow. That's etc. shadow. And that actually contains the encrypted passwords. However, most of you cannot view that because it's a highly protected file. Biggest problem is that file is only a flat file. It's like an edit, a plain text file. So how do you deal with thousands of users? We call larger scale typically thousands or even hundreds of users. We store them in a database called a directory service. Microsoft actually have one called Active Directory. 
and everybody else uses one called LDAP. Okay, LDAP directories and Active Directories. By the way, Active Directory actually does contain LDAP. So Active Directory contains LDAP as well as Microsoft ISMs. And at UTS, we're set up to have a central database called ADS root. So whenever you log onto any workstation, e.g. in um, outside of say building one or building five or building four, you actually will log in using your student number and your email password. It's the same password. Here's an example. Um, if you log on to email, it goes to ADS root, my student admin, UTS online, they all use the same password, the same user ID. It's the same system. Now, a lot of you had problems accessing, especially if you, those of you from outside the faculty, because at FATE, the Faculty of Engineering and IT, we have our own separate directory called, strangely enough, FATE. And it's the same user ID, 1234-5678, and the same password because it's linked to the two systems. They're called synchronization. I think the update happens every hour or every few minutes. So if you change your password here, it'll change it also on FATE as well two places you can change it. There's a third authentication system. Now notice we asked to do that start.it.utsedu.au reset. That actually updated another system called IT. We keep the two in sync with the FATE system, but it's a manual process. It's actually run, I guess, every five, ten minutes. They keep the two in sync, but it's not automatic. In fact, sometimes the update actually happens overnight which is not very good news if you change your password in one system, not the other. So just be careful of that. Usually it's immediate or within the next couple of minutes, not always. And we've got a third one. Now, that, by the way, this is why you have a separate login from Linux. It's actually that alphameric user, username from the start .it.utsedu.au reset. On Linux Gym, we have a third system. We're using a flat file. And unfortunately, this system is rather sad because it's manually updated. I actually update these passwords, and that's why you've got the trivial passwords called your student number. Not a good system. It will be linked one day to Linux, but that's not going to happen for a long time. We're now authenticated. Now we can work out what can we access. This is called an access control. So what other types of security accesses have we got? Well, we've got computer-based ones, but an obvious one is physical. We use, well, we don't use swipe cards, but we use our touch cards instead. We can access rooms, typically a token, or you might have a security guard who might let you in. I actually worked in a data center where we actually had uh, what we call airlock arrangements, when you could get in, but you couldn't get out unless you got typed a PIN number in as well. So they could lock you in and call the police if you were trying to sneak in with somebody's stolen card. It could be a logical access control. A good example is firewalls. You can't access the student workstations at all. The B11 workstations can't be accessed from outside. Definitely not. It's being enforced by a thing called a firewall. Uh, it could be enforced by an application. For example, UTS Online. You can't access, for example, uh, advanced database programming because you're first year students. But in all cases, we have to configure it somehow. And that, again, takes time and effort. You need to work out what's worth it. Topic, Unix. You'll need to know this stuff for the week three labs. And you'll also need to know it for the uh, assignment. So typically you have access controls that you have to deal with in Unix. Usually it's three levels of security. You have a user, the owner of the file can do something, a group, users can be in groups, or other people. And it groups into three sets of types of permissions. You can read it, or you can write it, or you can execute it, which means you can run the file or you can traverse, which means you can go down. You can go down, change directory to whatever. Okay, you set permissions on www. If it's got the X, you can go into that directory. And they're grouped in threes. So this first lot 
means the user. The second lot means the group. The third lot means others. This little indication in the front is only for directory. So if you see a minus sign, minus r minus minus, r minus minus, let's say one, two, three, this file would be readable only by the user and the group, and not by others. If you see something like this, for example, that means users, groups, and others can write. Strangely enough, you'll be very careful with this, because if you take permission off yourself, that's this one, you can't even read write your own file. Again, you can change permissions. So look at the lab today the Linux Gym Labs, that teaches you how to set these permissions, for Unix anyway. What else do we need to be aware of? Now, the last security mechanism we mentioned was audit logs. It's essential. For example, I need to work out if violations happen. It's really for catching. If we need to catch anything that happens wrong, we catch the violations and they're logged. Typically, they show little red X's somewhere. And it says, Chris has tried to access the uh, payroll system. Mm, not a good idea. You can do forensics. For example, you can say, hey, Chris has tried 15,000 times to access the payroll system. I think you'd be aware that something's seriously wrong there. But if you see it once, Chris tried to access the payroll system once on a Thursday morning when payday is due, you could say, well, he was accessing it once. That's the only time he did it might have been a mistake. So you have different actions depending on what happens. You can only work it out through the logs. And it's dependent on your security needs. Payroll, passwords, these are very important systems. But it doesn't matter if I look up the canteen um, recipe list. I don't think I really care that much. So it depends on your own needs. So that brings us to the final